All right, welcome to the latest episode of the Coleman Power Organic Fitness Podcast. I have most certainly Neve Fan Lee, most certainly all the way from County Mayo, who is most certainly a GIY enthusiast, showing people how to get started from most certainly growing nothing to growing something in 2024. Neve, say hello to the listeners. Hi, everyone. Hope you're all well. I suppose I brought Neve on to, I suppose, tell and not only her story, but also the likes of her skill set of where she most certainly has come from, a farming background, someone who also has a master's degree in um, most certainly her area of expertise. But Neve, yeah, tell us where I suppose it all started and we can kind of get going from there. Uh, well, I did study horticulture and I don't know, was it by accident or what, but I had a big interest in animals when I was younger and I always wanted to be uh, a vet. Now, I knew I would never, ever get the points for, for being a vet because I was, we'll say, below average in school, I'd say. Uh, I didn't really like school, but I thought I might get veterinary nursing. And that was on my CAO for the first position and the second position, and I didn't get either of them. And horticulture happened to be my third position. And uh, I was like, sure, we'll give it a go. It's outside. Um, I knew from a young age that outdoors was the place to be. Uh, I did think that would be with animals, but it ended up being horticulture. And uh, yeah, it's definitely one of the best things that's happened all right in my life. It's uh, It's funny when you look back on things and you really try to figure out why it's not going the way you want it to go. And it ends up being the best thing that that can happen to you. So that was a happy accident, maybe. Um, but so, yeah, I graduated in 2018 with a horticulture degree. Then I did my master's and that was focused on food production in Ireland and the Netherlands. And comparing the two, because Netherlands is a big producer of horticulture produce and Ireland some people really want to be good at that, but what's impeding the Ireland from producing a lot of their own food? Like we can produce a lot of potatoes, onions, all those sort of crops, but it doesn't seem to be happening. And that's purely down to supermarkets, uh, cheap food coming in from other countries and they just can't compete. So yeah. that was a that was a big eye opener, uh, big learning curve as well of how food is produced and it really opened my eyes uh to where our food comes from and what we're eating um, yeah and, th- and that's a, such a great point Niamh. we knew we were before we even pressed record there we we're just chatting about the likes of where food does come from and even people being aware of that like on every food item that has a packaging whether we touched on either blueberries or carrots or potatoes you can look at the origin of where it comes from so take, for example, there's a high percentage of even the potatoes that grow extremely well and so easily in Ireland. You put a potato in the ground, pretty much do very little to it and you get 10 more. That's the basic simple principles of a potato. There ain't too much more to it. But they come from Central Europe, such as Cyprus, if you're getting them for the 49 cent discount stores, which we will not mention on this podcast. The idea is we can literally grow a small bit of our own to produce the best type of foods possibly known to man, woman, and child. And the taste is the difference. Am I right in saying that, Neve? Oh, 100%. Like, and I get it all the time. So like, I would, I also grow my own stuff, but you give a few bits here and there, stuff you would have spared to neighbours or friends and all that. And they're like, they come back and like, Jesus. Like particularly carrots, that's always a big one in flavour and taste. Uh, potatoes, everything, tomatoes, all that. Um. But yeah, I it's just it it did open my eyes to God. Like, where is our food actually coming from, and what's in it? So, after my master's, I I did a bit of traveling and stuff, and I came back, and I knew food production after that was always always where I wanted to go. And so I came back, and I ended up working down in Cork with Brian McCarthy on Cork Roof Farm. Uh, that was a great and, learning experience. Um, and that's actually where we first met him, right? And saying that as I delivered yes. screws and artichokes and yak on, which are two massive superfoods. And Eve, <laughs> said, we we're after a meeting before. And I said, I know exactly what I had in my hand. Probably about four crates too many stacked from waist height above my head height, according to the shop. 
<laughs> yeah, I remember you coming in, all right, with Chris, and I was like, where is this lad going with this? I was like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> uh, but, oh, Coleman, like, he's, he, you know, everyone that's watching this or uh, obviously knows you already, but you're just so full of energy. Your presence is, you know, is very uplifting, and um, you're a great ambassador for the food industry as well. But, yeah, I just remember, I always remember the first time you meet you, and I'm like, God, oh, where is this lad going? <laughs> um and then so a cork rooftop farm I was there for about eight nine months I'd, I had a really great learning experience down there with Brian um do you know what he's doing at the minute and where he's going with his uh food journey and food production is is amazing like um so they've got a new parcel of land outside Cork and what they're going doing with that and the future project of that is is amazing, amazing like um the access to food for such a big population and all that and the opportunity for new growers to come in and work on a bit of land and grow their own food it sounds it sounds unreal um but yeah I had a great time down there uh great inspiration uh then a job opportunity came up closer to home here in Mayo and I'm working in a kitchen garden in Asher Castle so that project began in 2022. Um, so I'm working with the head gardener there and we're growing as much food as we can in a small space. And it's really nice. It's really progressive. Uh, we have a lot of new projects coming up and it's lovely. We do tours as well. It's really nice to show guests where their food come from and they're, they're just blown away about certain foods and how they grow. And it's very educational as well. Yeah. Uh, is there something that you I suppose in your own journey right now from growing uh, and went oh my god that I didn't know that it growed like it grew like that that it wasn't really even tasted that particular way is there anything that kind of stands out in your mind um everything really like it's been so intensive since I came back and started working here in Ireland in horticulture till now like it's been so intensive like the stuff I'm learning like I'm still really at the early stages of growing food and anything that stands out mm, like I say everything and I, I actually do mean it because like you realize you're like Jesus like and I would have grown stuff when I was younger and all that but yeah everything's like God you learn so much like and all you have to do is go out and do it yourself and hands in the soil and start supposed to yeah. it go from one stage to the other and I, one that stands in my in my mind and when i first started growing and just reminded me of that exact image when i saw you putting in the asparagus crowns there on uh, the likes yeah. of instagram so for people asparagus they barely know what it looks like i'm going to say some people wouldn't don't and even um i shame my own brother mightn't know what asparagus actually looks like it's the tall pencil or pen like um, I'm going to say vegetable that has most certainly spears on the top of it. And when it's at a later stage, it more so looks like the fox's tail, which again, very few people when I would do a, a course or an event would say, Coleman, I have no clue what that is. Is it fennel? Is it, they have the notion. And it's because at different stages, the plant, most certainly as we do, we look completely different from when we did when we were a baby, all the way to when we're going to be 60, 70 and 80 and 100, when I'm definitely going to live to the least. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, asparagus actually was a, a big one for me. I was like, Jesus. And it's lovely showing it to people as well because they're just like amazed by it. And it is amazing the way it grows. And um, actually, another one I thought of when they're talking there is um, the amount of flowers you can eat. I know that's not <laughs> a bulk uh, part of your diet or anything, but it's amazing the amount of flowers you can eat. Like, majority of them are edible. And they, a lot of them would add so much to a salad. Like if you add a load of borage, white and purple, even the chai flowers, they have so much flavor in them. Uh, so yeah, that was, that really just amazing to me anyways. And yeah, it's, it's like, you never stop learning. It's like with the bees, I have bees as well. And they'll always tell you when you get into beekeeping, like even if you're at it 50 years, you're still learning something. And I feel gardening is is like that as well. You'll always be presented with challenges that you didn't, you know, you thought you figured it out, but something else comes along and really messes with you. And it's great like that. 
I like that. Um, I love a good a good challenge and, you know, trying to figure out how to do it, you know, and you really have to think outside the box sometimes with, with different things. Yeah. And I know, Neve, you brought up the likes of flowers in particular. And just to even go back to that point and expand on it further, the point is, right, we'll go and touch on the likes of flowers and things that both, like most people, they might not even know what both is. It's going yeah. from, I suppose, the immature stage, the leaf, let's say it's a rocket leaf uh, salad or a minsoon or tatsoi, any of those oriental salads that tolerate the likes of the winter conditions which we had. And after that, they go and they, they bolt, they flower, all those leaves are edible. Those then uh, are one thing that people uh, often don't often consume. When you consume things that you don't often get into your diet, it improves the likes of your gut health. So we have the likes of every plant has to flower because inside in the flower, we have the fruits. And after the fruits, we have the likes of the seeds. And that's the full cycle that so many people miss out on. So I would always mention even the people that if something goes, oh, no, mine always bold. And I go, that's great. Now you get to save the seeds off it. So that idea yeah. of, I suppose, you sow a seed yourself. You harvest the leaves of whatever it is you're consuming, whether it's kale, another one of the brassicas, a rocket, um, and sooner ones that bring out my mind for the cold conditions. After that, then we save the little pods that are all um, quite easy to save for beginners. It's similar like a tiny pea, open it up, pop those little black seeds um, yeah. into like a brown paper bag for the likes of the duration of the winter. And you're ready to go again for whenever you would like to grow. Some people grow that rocket in the summer months, but I nearly prefer to grow with the seasons because they are part of the Brassica family that do like the cooler conditions. So I typically saw my kind of uh, rocket and uh, kale typically in the, I'm going to say cooler conditions, maybe August and September is when I start sowing them again. Yeah. Uh, well, it makes way for different summer crops then as well. But when you're on about different vegetables going to seed there as well, it's it's another side of gardening that people really don't know about. Because an example would be I let um two two of my cabbage plants go to seed there uh two years ago, was it? And everyone thought like, oh, it's really messy looking, like you know. They see when something goes to seed, like, oh, that's obviously not, you know, why haven't you taken that away? And I wouldn't mind, but the brassica flowers are so nice as well. And the amount of bees it does attract is unreal. Like I had this massive head of flowers, like just in, in season for so long and the amount of bees it attracts. And I knew I was going to see, uh, saving it for seed anyways, but um, I got, um, I must give you some, I have... <laughs> I'd say I have half kilo bag of uh, cabbage seed now uh, in the drawer, but it's, yeah, it's definitely another side of garden that people wouldn't see. Uh, you know, they think, oh, it's just a messy garden. But saving seed is quite important too, if you can. Uh, you'll find a small bit of space somewhere to save seed. And, uh, you know, that's really important too, as well for your own garden. You know, you can build up that genetic tolerance to your own growing conditions and all that and food security and whatnot yeah but yeah there's a you know there's different aspects to gardening where people you know would be like oh you know they just wouldn't know about it um yeah and you're so right maybe that's something uh, and you're so right in saying that, right? Sustainability is something that is so, so important. And people that do save their own seeds, like tomato is another real easy one. Right, we'll name out the top five easiest of the seeds to save. Definitely the tomato. You're literally taking off the flesh, which I wouldn't even throw away. I'd eat it. I would literally spread that out on a bit of cardboard, leave it dry out in your polytunnel glass house or your windowsill. Your potatoes, potato seeds are just the smaller ones that you can literally save that we typically don't eat. And then Leave, steep, steep them or leave them sorry in your shed or your I'm going to say dark press for the likes of when they're sowing them again the likes of your yeah. March month of March after that then we go with another real easy one is the likes of any of your brassicas so that's your kale that's your min, uh, rockets two another real real easy one and cabbage that you already have there as well any other two final ones that you might save your seeds from yourself any legumes they're they're legumes. really yeah, legumes really. Uh, just at the end of the season, you leave enough on for as much seed as you want. Let let it dry out in the plant. That's what I do. I don't pick them. I let them dry out in the plant, and they do just fine. Pick them, and they, yeah, really, it's the easiest tomatoes. Uh, another one would be, um, 
trying to think of another all the fruity ones are quite easy like um as long as they're not f1s you know cucumbers all them summer crops uh squash squash is like another squash. really good yeah one. another really yeah. easy one yeah. yeah and there's a variety of squash that i absolutely love i don't know if you've grown it yet crown prince you get your hands on it yeah yeah that's unreal it if stores so well <laughs> it stores so well it's the sweetest yeah. my god the sales of crown prince i'm leaning my head into the mic i've gone yeah. through the roof right? It is a beautiful blue, I'm going to say, uh, coated squash, but bright orange in the middle. Like this, like I've actually brought that to different um, uh, retreats and events that I do and given it to people. And they're like, oh my God, Coleman, is this, like, and I kind of sliced it in such a way and like, what kind of cake is this? And I said, that is just a squash. I'm the laziest, healthiest fella ever. I grab the squash from the shed, which was already just right beside the, like I said, a veg patch. I bring it into the oven, right beside the roast chicken. I pop it into the oven. An hour and a half, two hours later, I take it back out with gloves, put it down, slice it like a birthday cake and eat it. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. That's all you need, yeah. It's fantastic. And there's such a wide variety of squash plants that we can grow here as well that a lot of people wouldn't know about. You know, I suppose when you, you think of pumpkins and all that, everyone just thinks of your caravan ones, but... The variety you can grow here is unreal and they're so easy to grow and you'll have them depends how much you grow but you can store them up until february march the following year like easy. you know it's fantastic and uh, that's something actually um that i really kind of and it comes with time it does you know once you go from no gardening to growing your own stuff it's a progression so you start growing your own stuff figuring stuff out then you, you're trying to deal with gluts and that comes with time. But you slowly, well, this is what I found anyways, you slowly start preserving maybe one crop and then the following year, you know, it's going so well, then you start preserving, preserving, preserving other crops. And then that's how you get into it. You know, a lot of people get overwhelmed as well and almost give up, but it's the progressional thing. Like you just have to take it bit by bit and slowly and then you... You know how to use stuff better. You know how to preserve things in a certain way. Um, and I found that with my journey as well. That's, you know, that came with time as well. Um, and figuring out how to do that and how to use food. You know, people be like, like stuff will say, and they, and any sort of stuff, like pak choy. They're like, oh, you know, because they've probably never cooked with it before. But, you know, you start to learn how to use it in different dishes and, you know, and it varies your diet then, and then you become very seasonal. So, like, one thing that I would really miss is basil and pesto, really fresh pesto. So I always really look forward to that when I start coming in about June or so. And, you know, and that's really good because you're working with the seasons then and you're more aware of that. And it's nice because you look forward to stuff like that, all them summer crops coming. And then you do have some preserves going through the winter, but then you move on to a different diet with your winter autumn crops and then you're back around again. So it's a really nice process once once you start following uh, your own crop and plan and all that. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah, too right. I suppose, Neve, you'd be someone that's majorly into, I suppose, sustainability and different, I suppose, approaches to it, not only fruits and vegetables, but you're in the process of, well, firstly, you have, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, your own hens at the minute. Ah, yeah, we've always had hens growing up. Um, at the minute, yeah, we just have four. Uh, it's enough to keep us going. You know, everyone takes a few from the family and all that. Uh, they're lovely to have around. Uh, so you let them off down the field to do their own thing. they be in around the sheep and all that, and you bring them back in. But uh, yeah, it's always something we had. And yeah, there's nothing better than your your fresh eggs. Uh, luckily, they... They do slow down coming into the winter, but this winter we've had eggs right through the winter. So it's great. I know some people, <laughs> their hens just stop altogether. But you no, know, it's it's something people can get as well. Even if you have a small little holding or, a, a, you know, a small backyard, you can you can work it in such a way that you can have at least two hens. And it's, um, it's an invaluable source of food to have as well. Yeah, well, without a shadow of a doubt, complete protein, essential healthy fats. It contains vitamin A, D, E, and K. It's actually better than a tablet. And literally, it's outside your back door when you have your own hens, which is amazing. The taste, again, taste of yolk. Nothing yeah. like you've ever tasted before. But not only that, you're in the planning of getting two. 
Finks. <laughs> two Finks. <laughs> I want to name them. If anyone here would like to send in names to Leaves Pigs if she hasn't got oh, just no. yet. Oh, I don't think I can name them. Because I, <laughs> yeah. I get awful attached to animals and I've been warned by my parents, particularly my father, is like, why are you getting pigs? Is like, you know, like, you're not, you won't be able to kill them. And I was like, no, I will. I was like, I promise. They're not getting named. They're purely for meat and that's it. So, so no, definitely no names. No, no, no names. Scratch names. that. Neve does not want names. We're tracking <laughs> the names immediately. If you've sent them in already, I will keep them to myself for someone else and maybe my own um, in the future. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, it's a new adventure. Uh, look, pigs, for me, has been on the cards for a very, very long time. Um, so coming into the winter there, I was like, right, I need to get my act together now. Um, with a lot of planning, they have been, I've moved where they're going a, a lot of times, but I we've I, we've definitely found the perfect spot. Dad is great as well. He's, um, you know, I'd be lost without him. Ant and I come up with and want suggestions or ideas he's straight on to it so he found a perfect spot for them there's an old old shed down um beside a bit of forestry we have it's on the edge of it so that's their housing that's already sorted and then uh we're making a little a fairly big cornered off area of that forestry area and they can go in there graze they have shelter and yeah they'll clear a bit of the land as well there's a lot of briars and stuff a bit of overgrown stuff so with time they'll gradually um naturally clear that land regenerate it as well with all their fertilizer and uh, we'll keep moving them on and we'll see how we go from there um but i would have taken a lot of inspiration from brendan in 4 a firm i was just going to mention it i swear <laughs> to god i literally as i was yeah. sitting here going for we have um, Brendan. Yeah, I'll be very friendly with him. Um, lovely fella. Yeah. And uh, again, just like I always recommend to people to send me a message privately to touch base, like send Brendan, send yeah, yourself, Neve, any questions they have on growing your own. Because people who would put out things and have social media pages, that's what they want to do because they're already doing yeah. it for free anyway. So if someone says, yeah. them, oh, I'm not sure, how did you do and plant uh, those squash? Was there any tips or what variety? I can't remember, Neve. Is there anything else? Uh, remember you told me to leave the peas on the, or was it take them off? I can't remember. Like you ask the question to the right person, you get the right answer. Oh yeah, definitely. Anyone that's doing this on social media, doing their passion, they're more than happy. They love to see messages coming in of how do I do this? Or, you know, sending pictures. Um, I've been getting a lot lately on setting up a grown area. It's just I'm getting a lot of yeah beginner messages of how you know how do I start like just a simple question, um and it's great like you can give them a good few options depending. And how how on neat would you recommend out. right so to start people off right I am gonna just throw the word in there that's been used no dig. So we have a grassy area that we are cutting every single year. I'm sick to the death of going out, pushing that mower around the place. How do I and what do I do is day one? Okay, so it's important if you've never grown before to start off small. Because if you decide very enthusiastically someday, Jesus, I'm going to do 20 New meters fast. squared, like I would not recommend that. And I've heard that a lot from people coming to me saying, oh, geez, there a few years ago, we built eight res beds and now it's just all weeds. And it's, it, you know, it's disheartening as well. It's like, you know, if they started off with the one and managed that and figured out, because if you go from not grown to, to trying to manage eight raised beds, like I don't think I would manage eight raised beds. You know, <laughs> you just have to take it bit by bit. So what I would recommend is, yeah, definitely go for no dig. Uh, mow down a patch, a small patch where you can fit maybe two beds. Now, the width of the bed is up to you. So what you're comfortable working with. What I would recommend is put down like bamboo sticks for the corners and maybe a bit of string around so you can visualize that bed. So you can go as wide as you want or, or narrow. So... I do like the narrower beds because I can stand over them and work over them that way. I find it better for my for my legs and my back. 
you might want to go wider so you can go up to maybe one 1.5 meters maybe a bit more and you can work from either side but it's purely up to you so get a feel for that first before you start doing anything and then you can go as long as you want um once you have that figured out you just mow your area down really well it's in it as much as you can get your care board wet it and then start adding your compost to those bed widths that you want um then for paths like you can leave the care board that will dis disintegrate over time and the weeds will start coming up so i do recommend if you can get any or organic material you can into those paths so you could have like if you know a tree surgeon um they always have this big stockpile of chipped uh, trees in their in their yard so i'd recommend getting in contact do you know someone that knows someone as well with that sort of stuff um and even stuff from around your own yard and just fill in those paths and you might have to top them up once or twice a year but um i would recommend investing in a nice compost so you can get a bit of mix going on there you can get mushroom compost you can get a compost topsoil mix and it's worth investing in that to get a good foundation for your growing area as well uh, and you should start planting straight away and yep and it's as easy as that so that's that no dig yep. that you might see and people often say i'm going to something i've heard something about no dig but i don't know what it is that's simply what it is mowing down your grass putting down cardboard wetting it putting in some sort of growing medium for yourself to plant in the main thing as me said determine what size width beds that you want i like them i wouldn't say too wide i like them one point so it's a meter uh, a meter point three just so i can have full capability of kneeling down on one side reaching over to the other going around to the other side or jumping over and being able to reach halfway that is the key key thing i do not like beds that are any more than two meters because otherwise you're tiptoeing no matter how flexible yoga grounding stretching routine that you get you'll be stepping in on the beds and that wrecks my head don't be walking on your beds you'll be no more jumping on the beds, as the monkey says, or as my niece says. So that is yeah. literally key for what you want to do. Lay it out. Draw it on a piece of paper, clearly as day, and not to take on too much at any one time. Do not, most certainly, as niece says, take on a 20 meter by 20 uh, square foot area so that literally there's nothing that you can literally control and the weeds that come up at the end of the day slow and steady you build on that and the knowledge go oh yeah i now know how to keep the weeds down or control and even having a, a weed free bed this is one that i would recommend the three sisters if anyone hasn't heard of it it's really one raised bed or a bed on the flat with i'm going to say two sweet corn plants in the middle that's going to literally be the anchor to the beans that literally wind up around that sweet corn and the likes of one, two, three, three different squash, whether it be crown prince, butternut squash, or any of the gourds that you can also, or pumpkins that you could have as well as a weed suppressant covering the ground. So there's no weeding going on there. The sweet corn goes up here, another sweet corn over this area for those people watching on YouTube. In on top of that, what goes around the likes of those is the climbing French beans or uh, runner beans that you then harvest intermittently. Because that's what it's, it's a technique that was done years ago by the Indians day one. And literally they came, they harvested some of the likes of the sweet corn. Then they went away, then they came back, then they took some of the beans with them and went away and came back tail end of the year the squash and most certainly are still there harvest the squash cook it in a pot make whatever they want out of um those uh, ingredients yeah yeah it's fantastic um yeah and just you know grow grow what you want as well like you know don't be going fancy and all that and gradually over time then you'll want to try new things and you know, you'll become a more adaptable as well. But, you know, even starting growing off a bit of lettuce, like you can even start off container growing if you want to. So lettuce works fine in containers, herbs. And once you start off with that and be able to manage that and you'll just, you'll want to do more because you'll realize, you know, geez, that's great. Like you can grow a bit of that. Why can I not try this? And it, yeah, it's a journey. Like don't... Don't start off big and try to rush it because I can guarantee you it'll it won't work out for you. You get overwhelmed and you'll you'll give up. And that's not what you know, like no, yeah, you have to start small and you'll see the progress. And it's about gaining momentum as well. And then you'll be flying. Yeah. yeah.
I suppose, Neve, you're a massive advocate for people looking to, I suppose, change the way they currently look at foods and or people who want to start off their own, I'm going to say, growing um, journey in itself. And I suppose I appreciate your time even giving it to me today to record this podcast. Is there anywhere, most certainly, if you would like people to check you out, whether it be social media or anything else for that matter, what is the handles? And I'll po- post that up. Uh, well, Instagram is my biggest one. And that's just Neve underscore Flanley. And then I am on Facebook as well. And that's just Neve Flanley as well. Um, I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two, two platforms is enough for me at the minute anyways. Uh, would I ever go on YouTube? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I would like to. Um, look, we'll see. We'll see how the next six months, year go. And if there's enough interest, I might start. But for now, it's just those two platforms. Uh, I just try to put up as much informative uh, information as I can. They're usually short reels. Uh, people seem to like that, you know. Um, and I, I'll definitely keep doing that. I have a bit on the farm as well. I don't have much on the farm. Uh, I just don't get time to do it. I will hopefully have a lot when I get these pigs, uh, but it's mostly garden content. Perfect job. Neve. and I know you have an event on the likes of February the 17th, but you've actually even informed me that that's completely sold out. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, geez, off the surprised. It's my first workshop on growing. Uh, it's hosted by Fiona Egan, her cooker school in Longford. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. There must be a big push for wanting to grow your own food. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted, really looking forward to it now. Um, you know, encourage and inspire others to grow their own. And it'll just be a simple, you know, set up garden layout, how to start growing on a small scale, um, you know, seedlings, crop plan and all that. And yeah, not really looking forward to that now. Yeah, right. Uh, Neve, thanks so much. And I'm going to tell the listeners to most certainly stay tuned for any other different events on most certainly Neve's uh, pages, whether it be on Facebook and advertised also on Instagram. But Neve, I always end these podcasts by saying stay tuned, stay classy and keep it organic.